Hey there, Dango Stu here. Today's video is all about AIS and is proudly sponsored by MarineEngine.com. Every now and then boats will bump into each other and that's why AIS or the Automatic Identification System was invented. At its core, AIS is a system that allows a boat to transmit information about itself to other boats in the local area. The information I'm talking about here is things like your position, your course, your speed. All the information that makes it much easier for a boat to determine if you're on a collision course and to have it automatically identified. Because the AIS units have course, heading, rate of turn, all this kind of information, it's possible for the computers on board, i.e. your multifunction display, to calculate whether you are going to be on a collision course in the future. Now I said the local area and by that I mean that this information is transmitted from boat to boat over radio waves. You can be in the middle of the ocean, you don't need internet access, anything like that. It's transmitted over a frequency slightly higher than channel 16, so in the VHF spectrum, to a boat nearby which is roughly about 20 miles away. You can see how a multifunction display can use that information to detect a collision quite early. If it can see you 20 miles away, even if a boat's travelling at 20 knots, you've still got an hour's notice of a potential collision. Radar has predominantly been the tool for that in the past, and obviously radar is critical still. Radar tells you what's actually there, tells you every boat. It can pick up as much as a mooring buoy in the water. It's so sensitive these days. AAS will only tell you about boats that are actively transmitting it, which is obviously not all boats, but when there is a boat actively transmitting it, you know that you've really got detailed information about that boat. And on top of that, they've got information about you, so you're safer as well knowing they can see you. How this actually works is quite interesting, so I'll take you through the process. The story of the Automatic Identification System, or AAS, begins when the first boat comes along. This boat wants to transmit its position and course information, and to do this it uses a system called Time Division Multiple Access, or self-organising Time Division Multiple Access. This involves having a frame that's one minute long, and it gets divided into 2,250 little slots. I haven't drawn them all, but you get the idea. If you do the maths, it works out they're about 26 milliseconds long. This boat chooses an empty slot, allocates it to itself, and then only transmits its information in that little time slot. Obviously, there's not much chance of a boat having a collision when there's no other boats around, but should Renko come into the same area, my AOS unit will start listening and it'll find one of these 26 millisecond time slots in the frame that's not currently used, allocate it and start transmitting its own position. Both boats will continue to transmit their positions in their two allocated slots, thereby greatly reducing the chance of having a collision because they'll get warnings, they'll see each other and they'll know each other's course and speed. It is possible for two boats to start transmitting in the same time slot if, for example, they pick their time slots while they weren't near each other and then they come into the same cell, the same sort of VHF area. Now, that's generally not a huge problem because if those two boats transmit at the same time, I will pick up the one that's got the strongest signal, which is obviously the boat closest to me and the one I'm most likely to have a collision with. Also, what happens is that these time slots that have been chosen, they time out at a random time, and then a new one's chosen. You don't just grab one and stick with it for a long period of time. So if there is a, you know, an overlap in time slots, that'll get rectified pretty quickly. All right, now we understand how it works, let's take a look at the AIS unit that's installed on Renko. I have a Raymarine AIS 700, which is a dedicated AIS unit. Sometimes they're built into VHF radios. This kind of makes sense because the VHF radio shares a lot of technology with the AIS. They both transmit and receive on the VHF spectrum. There's one downside sometimes though, is that because the frequency is slightly different to AIS, you really want two antennas, one tuned for AIS, one tuned for VHF. You can obviously get limited performance from a shared antenna that's a compromised tuning, which is something that uh, John and I did in the previous video on my VHF radio. But if you can, ideally, it's worth having the two. Not only are they then tuned to the two frequencies they need, they can actually act as redundant backups for each other. The difference isn't huge. Uh, VHF channel 16 is about 156.8 or something, I think, megahertz, and AIS is about 162 megahertz. So they're in the same ballpark, but not exactly the same. All right, let's go back in time and take a look at installing mine. Um, here's my uh, final installation. I didn't uh, 
get all this sicker flex off yet. I think I might actually just paint white over it probably sometime in about 2023, maybe, maybe. Anyway, but John from Rain Rain is back here yeah. <laughs> and he had a point about my coil. Now, yeah, so I'm looking at that and, and Stu's done what a lot of people do. You got excess cable. What do you do with it? Well, first thing is don't cut it and rejoin it yeah. unless you have some specialist tools to validate that. But I guess the nuts and bolts are don't do it. Yep. So we need to find a way to store the excess cable. Most people coil it up, put a cable tie around it like Stu's <laughs> done here, which nine times out of ten might be okay. The best thing is to waffle it. So you would create a large coil with it. You then use a couple of cable ties and squeeze it together so you got these oval shapes. That that way we're not going to create an, you know, an unintended antenna and start mm -hmm. getting other problems in there. I guess the other thing to be mindful of is when you squeeze the cables down, we want that bend radius to still maintain at least 10 centimetres on the end. So okay. nice big loop, cable tie at each end, and we keep a nice loop at each end and then we store it somewhere out of the way. These five ways have good O-ring sealed connectors. That's kind of the whole idea of the STNG connectors, but they also are designed to be installed pointing downwards so that, you know, there's even less chance of water getting in. These screw holes make it easy to put into like a bulkhead here, but you can also go up into a, a deckhead or something like that. I'm gonna use these screw holes I haven't used just to cable tie this in place and stop it vibrating around. Before we can install the AIS though, I need to have an MMSI, which is a mobile marine service identifier. Think of it a bit as your phone number on the water sort of thing. I need to apply for that. Uh, in Australia, you apply through AMSA, which is our Maritime Safety Authority. It'll vary from country to country. In order to get my MMSI, I had to provide AMSA with information about my radio certificate of proficiency. So you have to have your radio operator's license because you are transmitting on the VHF spectrum, even though you're not talking straight into it. So you need to have your license first, then you can apply for your MMSI. Once you've got that, you can program it into your AAS and start using it. Also, just to show you quickly, if I go on to the beacons.amsa website, I can go into the section on MMSIs and see any ones I have registered. Here, I've got this one, which is registered to Renko. So, we're going to configure the AIS at the moment, is that right? That's it, yeah. Okay. So, we're going to set the MMSI details into the AIS yep. before we go and put it into the boat so yep. we can then connect everything up to it. Yeah. So, we, so, we do that using the laptop. Yep. And we're just using a USB cable to a mini USB. I think we showed that previously. And it plugs in the front of the unit. Mm -hmm. To just program it, you don't need to power the unit externally. It can power just from USB for this, so we can get it programmed. Then we can put it in. And we can also use that port to check that everything is working as we're expecting. Mm -hmm. um, most problems people have with getting the connection between the two is their USB cable is a charge only cable, doesn't carry right, data, okay. um, or drivers haven't been installed. There is a driver package which is part of the Pro AIS2 package that mm -hmm. we use to program that is on our website. Uh, there are limitations of who can do that programming depending on where you are in the world. Um, so just definitely check with your, your local authority about that, but in Australia that's not something we have a restriction on, so we can program that detail into here. But that's restricted in the US, is it? I believe the US yeah, is the only place okay. that, that is restricted, yeah. So, okay. so what we do is we plug into the computer in the USB, we put the USB plug into the unit in the front here, and we usually get a, a light to tell us that there is something there. Now what we're looking for in here is we're in the device manager, this is a Windows machine, uh, we're looking that there has been a COM port assigned to it. We can see this one, my computer has assigned this COM14. Mm -hmm. So that's great, and then we just uh, Open up the Pro AIS 2 software. Of course, I've used this many times. It's already installed for me. It doesn't scale right in my computer for some reason. Don't know why. But what we look at the top here is we're looking for that particular COM port and it's identified as a Class B AIS transceiver. So that's great. We'll just select that one and we'll go ahead and connect to it. So now we're connected to the unit, we can see there is no details for MMSI and the ship's name and those sorts of things. So we're going to go ahead and enter that right now. Okay, we have to be very careful when we check this because we get one one shot at it as a, as a user of the product or entering the product. If we get it wrong, we'll have to get this reset and this has to be re reset by someone other than the user of the product. Mm -hmm. So that's usually a Raymarine service dealer or somebody like that or mm -hmm. Raymarine themselves. 
I didn't do a particularly good job of filming the screen while John was configuring my AAS originally. So I'll go back now, I'll plug the laptop back in and I'll show you the kind of information you get from that application and the types of things you configure. The first thing I should say, which I don't think I made clear earlier, is that Pro AIS 2 is free software you download from the Raymarine website, so nice and easy, just grab that and run it. Here on the configuration screen, you can see my MSI is programmed in and it's greyed out because it can no longer be changed. As John said, you get one shot to enter that correctly. Then I can also enter my vessel type. I've just put 37, Pleasure Craft, and I've put the ship's name as Renko. You'll also notice there's a section now below where I can tell AIS where my GPS antenna is on the vessel. This I think is much more important with a big boat, but you can say. GNSS is the Global Navigation Satellite System, so it's a generic term for GPS, GLONASS, all the various types of satellite networks. Here I can see the satellites I'm using and what signal strengths I'm getting. The next tab shows you all the vessels that are currently within radio reception range of me. As you can see, it's quite a few, and you can see the type of information that it gives you about each of those vessels. The last screen is about diagnostics. You can see here it's running some checks, the antenna goes green, power goes green, but we do have a reasonably high VSWR. The 3.8 to 1 is not really great. The reason for this is that the antenna I currently have plugged into my AIS is a straight sort of voice spectrum VHF antenna. I either need to tune it, chop it down a little bit to work for the AIS spectrum, or just buy a dedicated AIS antenna, one of the two to fix that problem though. Now what I'll do is show you what AIS looks like on the Raymarine multifunction display if I was underway. I'm at anchor at the moment, so it's probably not the best example, but I'll find some more for you down the track. I'm currently on my anchor alarm view, but that doesn't really matter. We should still see boats. Now, here we've got a boat here, it shows up as a green boat, and if we press it, we can get some information about it. This particular boat is Impy, which is actually uh, a friend of mine uh, who does his own YouTube channel. So we're gonna go and chat to him and start doing another video on weather this afternoon. You can see though that we can see the vessel here, and if I click on it again, we can also see speed over ground, 0.1 knot, essentially going around on anchor. You can set up the Raymarine unit to only show boats that are not at anchor, i.e. boats with a speed above about 0.2 of a knot or something like this, but I leave it showing all boats. Now one feature I find incredibly useful with AIS that you don't get on radar is that it shows you the vessel name. By clicking on it, it tells me it's Catamaran MP. What that means is I can get on the radio and call the boat by name. You're much more likely to get a response from a boat by calling them by name than by saying sailing catamaran off danger point or whatever, because it doesn't quite register in the ear of the skipper of that boat. Knowing the names of all the boats that are around you with their AAS on just makes it so much easier to call them on the radio, and I think that's a feature that's worth it alone. This brings me to another point though, is that sometimes when you're offshore, you'll see a boat appear and you'll just see its MSI, that number we talked about. And you'll see its course, you'll see its speed, but only the number, which makes it a little bit hard to call it on the radio. The information about a boat that changes gets sent quite frequently, even more frequently when the boat's moving quickly. So I'll see a boat appear on the limit of my VHF range, but I'll just see its MMSI and then I'll see its position, course and speed. Then what happens is that boat will transmit the information that doesn't change, such as the name of the vessel, the type of the vessel, every six minutes. So depending on when it last sent it, it might be a few minutes before that MSI changes into the boat name. So if you notice the MSI originally, then you see it flip to an actual name, you know why that's happening. To give you an idea of how AAS looks underway and how it helps identify potential collisions, we'll actually go back in time to when I first installed it and a mate Rod took me out in his boat to have a look at Renko's transmission so we could see that it was all working properly. So I'll show you that. I'm on the Hawkes River Community Assist boat at the moment and we're just seeing that we can see Renko as an AAS target without any internet. This is just straight radio to radio. So this is just all data transmitted purely through the radio antennas, straight from Renko to their boat. Ah, oh, yep. And there's Renko on the radar with the AAS overlay as well. This is Renko here, flashing red, saying we're a potential collision hazard.
it's also worth noting that the multifunction display can be configured to give full-on audible alarms if these uh, potential collisions are identified but that's something you tend to turn on offshore when there's fewer boats than when you're driving around the harbour. Oh, that was really nice to confirm the uh, ship to ship AIS is working. Obviously you're transmitting fine if uh, it appears on marinetraffic.com because it has to get there through the waves, but uh, it's nice to have that first ability to step on a boat and go, yep, you're showing up just in front of me, which is the whole idea. An interesting aspect to AIS, and one that you can get involved in directly, even if you don't own a boat, is that people eventually realised this information was very useful for things other than avoiding collisions. It meant that people who owned fleets of ships could manage the ships much better, they could keep an eye on where they all are, what's happening with them. It really meant that this information got used a lot back in head office as well as on board the bridge. To do this they developed and launched some satellites that were capable of detecting these standard VHF transmissions from low earth orbit. Nothing new had to happen on the boat itself, you didn't need to install a satellite dish or anything. The 20 miles across the ocean that a VHF transmits is actually quite a long way when you consider 20 miles up. You don't have the curvature of the earth, the atmosphere gets thinner etc etc. So this meant then that all the AIS information could be gathered and sent to a server on the internet that could then be viewed from anywhere and that's something you can do. A popular website for doing this is called marinetraffic.com so I'll show you that. So this is what the website looks like. I'm here sort of zoomed in on the Gold Coast area which is where I am at the moment. One of the most useful features here though is the ability to search for a vessel. You can come to this top right search area. I've got some previous searches. I can just search for Renko here. Then when I find it, it comes up with uh, all the vessel information. You can see a section here that says unlock voyage information. I'm just using the free version of marine traffic, uh, but you can pay to get more information, which is something a lot of businesses perhaps would do. Then if I want over here under an ad, because I've got the free version, is a section saying show live on map. If I click on that, it'll take me to a map and I can then close this information which is just on the vessel itself, and then zoom in and get a live bit of information on where the boat is. So this website pretty much aggregates all the information. Every bit of positioning it gets from the boats is sent by that boat's AIS unit over VHF radio, and ultimately gets collected by the base stations that send the information to the internet, or satellites that send the information to the internet, and it appears on their website. So it's pretty cool and something anyone can use. All right, there's a lot more we could go through, but hopefully this gives you a basic understanding of what AIS is about and what's involved in getting it fitted to your boat. The AIS unit has a GPS antenna plugged into it as well, but it can get other sources of GPS off the NMEA network. So, you know, depending on your installation, it can get a little bit more complicated. There are generally class A and class B uh, AIS units. Mine's a class B. That particular class is used most commonly on recreational vessels, but big tankers, ships and things will have class A AIS. So don't worry too much about that. You just need a decent quality class B AIS and you'll be fine. All right, well take care and I'll catch you next week when we start going through some of the aspects of weather forecasting for boaters. All right, see you then. trying to eat the chicken seed. Cheeky bugger. Oi. <laughs>